Welcome back everybody for our afternoon program here at the Global Space Exploration Conference, GREX 2021. I hope you had a nice networking lunch and our next plenary session is now going to start. It is organized by the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, the ISEC, and it is titled Exploring Together Opportunities, Challenges, and the role of ISEC in engaging emerging space agencies. Again, you will have the opportunity to engage in the discussion, use the Slido system and to ask questions, and you will also get some poll questions there. And now, it is my great pleasure to welcome back again on stage our almost full-time GREX 2021 moderator, <laughs> Pascal, <laughs> Professor Pascal Ehrenfreund, the IEF president. Pascal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian, and dear delegate, it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to the plenary Exploring Together, Opportunities, Challenges, and the Role of the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, Isaac G, in engaging emerging space agencies. So as the new era of space exploration unfolds, an increasing number of space agencies worldwide are becoming engaged in space exploration. This is evidenced by the dramatic expansion in the membership of the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, which is an interagency coordination forum created in 2007 to advance individual and collective efforts in space exploration. So I um, recommend that you actually really look at the website of the Isaac G, uh, because they are very important documents and very helpful, informative documents. In January 2018, the Isaac G produced the third edition of the Global Exploration Roadmap, which captured a shared vision for robotic and human space exploration of, at that time, 15 member agencies. But since then, ISAC membership has steadily increased and many space agencies have actually renewed their focus on the moon or, uh, or on Mars. And these circumstances created an opportunity uh, for the ISAC G to release in um, August 2020 the Lunar Surface Exploration Scenario Update as a supplement document to the Global Exploration Roadmap. And this document was already produced by 24 member agencies and laid out the latest mission scenario and architecture for human robotic uh, lunar surface operations and integrated, renewed, and also emerging <coughs> national plans and commercial capabilities among Isaac G participating countries. And as of today, Isaac G has 26 member agencies. I'm sure that uh, the panel members will go into more detail, but it is really important uh, to say that the organization, the International Space Exploration Coordination uh, Group, is a real um, treasure of information because it really summarizes all the different capabilities uh, and plans of so many now, 26 space agencies, and it is very helpful if you plan international cooperation in the future. So this plenary session will bring together emerging space agencies and Isaac G. The first part of the session will introduce Isaac G and its work, and including the informative document like the Global Exploration Roadmap, and uh, what will also be presented is the Isaac G Emerging Space Agency Working Group. And the second part of the session will address challenges and opportunities for emerging agencies and the importance of international partnership and the role of Isaac G in fostering uh, their participation in global space exploration. I want to draw you very uh, uh, fast to the audience polling. There are two questions which you can actually answer uh, from the audience. Um, and there are two questions. Question one is, in your opinion, what do you think is the biggest obstacle for emerging nations for joining global space exploration? And question number two is, did you know 
Isaac Chi, the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, before. Do you think it's a useful platform for advancing international partnerships in exploration, especially for engaging emerging nations? Um, you will be given several um, options to answer, and we ask you kindly, um, all the audience here in, the, in St. Petersburg, but also in online, uh, to help with the answer of these questions, and uh, the chair of the International Space Exploration uh, uh, Coordination Group will then uh, discuss the result. Um, it is now um, my pleasure to introduce uh, panel, the panel members. Uh, this is Christian Lange, the current chair of the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. He is the director for space exploration planning, coordination, and advanced concepts at the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, the next panel member is Guang Hui Guang. He is the Isaac Chi Emerging Space Agency co-chair and principal researcher. Uh, he comes from the Space Exploration Research Division from the Korea Aerospace Research Institute, CARI. Anthony Murphy, he is the deputy head of the Australian Space Agency, ASA. And Salvador, uh, Salvador Landeros, the Director General of the Agencia Espacial Mexicana, I hope I pronounced that well, and um, Gregor Brochner, the President of the Polish Space Agency, Polsa, is here with us in St. Petersburg in person, and so is Salem Almari, the Assistant Director for Science and Technology, Astronaut Program Manager from the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. So we see we have a really great panel uh, from all over the world, partly remotely, partly here. And now the Isaac G. Chair, Christian Lange, will set the scene. Christian? Thank you, Pascal. Good day, good morning, everyone here from, uh, from Canada. First of all, a big thanks to the organizers for uh, well, setting up the conference and obviously uh, allowing the remote participation of uh, some of us and hence making this panel possible. So really much appreciated. Thanks Pascal for moderating and uh, well love to be in, in St. Petersburg today but uh, at least I'm there virtually so much appreciated. On that note also thanks uh, Pascal already for setting the stage for the ISAC. You already gave lots of details so it's really good. And I think also during the uh, conference so far, the importance has been highlighted in several talks of international collaboration and coordination, which is really key for the ISAC. So I think it fits well in here. And also we heard a strong emphasis on the role of emerging nations during the high level space panel earlier this week, especially highlighted, highlighted by Norway. So if you could go to slide number two, please. Uh, just checking here my visual. Yes, thank you. So uh, the ISEC, the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, it really uh, started with the Global Exploration Strategy in 2007. And the key there was really to present a vision for the robotic and human space exploration, focusing on destinations in the solar system where we may one day live and work. And I guess in 2007, actually, that pretty much sounded still like fiction. And I think with the recent developments, things have changed. Things become a lot more real now and we turn uh, the science fiction into reality. Lots of advances have been made. So it's, it's really good to see. And one other point also that's really important to the ISAC if to, is to define those plans and strategies of all the individual nations to make this whole exploration piece uh, more effectively and more safe. Recalling ISAC G is a collaborative work that is uh, done in a non binding, consensus driven manner to advance this exploration strategy. So we are discussing the individual plans and objectives and try to lay them out in those consensus products while also supporting the promotion of interest and the engagement of space agency activities throughout society. 
the changes and the dynamics and the kind of evergreen uh, environment, as Pascal has mentioned, is also demonstrated by the increased number of agencies that have joined. And since 2018, we had Brazil, Luxembourg, Norway, Poland, Romania, Switzerland, Vietnam, Australia, and Thailand. So it re has really changed uh, what we can do, and it has also changed the dynamics of the ISEC-G. And just recently, we formed a new working group on the commercialization aspects and also on emerging space agencies, which obviously gave rise to this forum here today. You see a bit the working group structure of the ISEC-G here on this slide. And uh, right now we have 250 people roughly active in the ISEC from all those 26 agencies. And through the work of the ISEC, we are not only sharing information and coordinating our developments, but we also produce products. Those products are related to strategic knowledge gaps. They're related to the benefits of exploration. We are assessing technology gaps and Last but not least, and one of the most uh, visible products is obviously the Global Exploration Roadmap and the uh, recent supplement. If you could go to the next slide, please. So speaking of the supplement, starting from the Global Exploration Strategy, <clears throat> the Global Exploration Roadmap was built. And here I would like to emphasize it's not a static product. It's really a living document that showcases the evolving capabilities and the achievements of the ISAC agencies throughout time. We try to basically depict their common shared exploration objectives. And in the uh, 2018 version, also known as GR3, there's really a strong focus on the importance of collaboration and realizing individual and common goals and objectives in space exploration. The more recent 2020 GR supplement is really focused also on the increasing international community's focus on lunar exploration. Hence, a much more detailed uh, lunar surface exploration scenario is depicted, which I will present in a moment. And it's also the uh, recognition, recognition of the changes in the lunar exploration programs and, and also of the increased community. As Pascal mentioned, we had nine more agencies uh, who supported the supplement. On that note, I would also like to highlight the uh, related GLEX paper on the supplement that was uh, published by the ISEC-G. Then if you go to the next slide, please, you will see this kind of fairly busy graphics and I'm not planning really to go into the detail, but rather invite you to dive into the last GR and especially the GR supplement if you want to know more about the lunar plans. Here, again, the key is that this document, this 2022, uh, 2020 supplement, represents the updated lunar scenario. And here the key is also, it's a consensus of all the, of all the agencies that contributed to the supplement. If you start from the far left there, you see basically the initial capabilities with a two crew mission. And uh, I would say, some basic infrastructure. And then we see the phases, boots on the moon, and then phase two and three, with the last one being really the mass forward. We see a habitation, we see ISRU, we see lots of things that are happening. And that's the infrastructure we want to build and that we want to build together. And I think that also sets nicely the scene to see the transition for the emerging space agency and, and also for all the others that there's a lot of room to contribute to this new uh, lunar reality. And we want to make this sustained presence on the moon really a, a key achievement for all of us. And on that note, I would like to conclude my presentation by calling us to explore together. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Christian. I'm, I'm calling now on uh, Mr. Guang. He is the co-chair of the Emerging Space Agency Working Group, and he will very briefly, in two minutes, uh, sketch this working group. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pascal. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great honor to join this wonderful plenary session uh, as a panelist with a notable 
space leaders. My name is Wang Ju, working for CARI in Space Exploration Research Division, and I'm currently uh, serving as a co-chair ISECG Emerging Space Agency Working Group uh, with the uh, Australian Space Agency. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, as uh, the Christian mentioned, ISECG membership expanded uh, up to 26 agencies during the last two years uh, by increased participation uh, with the Emerging Space Agency in space exploration. So uh, the ISECG uh, representatives recognize the need of, for international coordination in space exploration, especially focused on the, to accommodate needs and perspective of emerging space agency in ISECG activities. So uh, that's why uh, the new Emerging Space Agency Working Group uh, is organized. Uh, currently, uh, we are 12 member uh, state agencies uh, with uh, uh, around 30 uh, members uh, working together. And so actually, the end of last year, uh, we started as a Tiger team, and currently uh, we are allowed to have a permanent working group status uh, as of April 2021. So our initial focus in on uh, information sharing on uh, each agency's activities to identify common interest and area of a potential collaboration. So now we are planning to uh, collect new ideas and methods to promote collaboration among the emerging, emerging space agencies between uh, emerging and established agencies and also uh, come together with a, a private sector to be explored. And also uh, we are trying to uh, contribute to the formulation of a GR4 uh, and other ISECG product from the Emerging Space Agency's perspective. Uh, actually, uh, that's all for uh, my uh, explanation about the uh, Emerging Space Agency Working Group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kwong. I, um, we are coming now to the uh, topics discussion and the questions I will pose uh, to the distinguished panel are similar to actually the uh, the polling and um, you can then see you know uh, uh, how we actually all believe uh, that we can go in the future so uh, I'm asking a question to the five uh, panel members uh, now um, what activities and plans do emerging agencies have what are the biggest challenges and opportunities uh, faced by emerging agencies in joining global space exploration? And I will begin with asking um, Salim Almari from the United Arab Emirates to answer this question. If you want me to repeat it, uh, let me know. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Pascal. I think uh, I've got the question. So. Um, I I mean, we've heard a lot uh, during this conference uh, about the UAE and others, uh, what their activities are. And I think, you know, there are a lot of opportunities uh, today looking at uh, the way the commercial players are able to support delivering small or medium-sized payloads or rovers to the moon's surface. So this is definitely an opportunity, I think, for uh, emerging space nations, uh, especially newcomers to uh, space exploration missions, especially exploring the moon. Uh, but I think one of the uh, major challenges, obviously, that face uh, smaller countries uh, in this field, uh, maybe two challenges, obviously, one of them is uh, securing the suitable budget to be able to go ahead and uh, go ahead with exploration programs. And this one is partly solved with some of the things that I just mentioned, which is uh, s cheaper solutions, easier solutions of getting uh, to the moon through commercial players. So this one, hopefully in the coming years, uh, is solving itself with more activities and more people trying to get to the moon. That will drive the cost down. 
Uh, but I think the other, uh, maybe more important aspect is obviously securing the political will uh, in smaller countries or countries that are not maybe used to uh, spending money on space exploration. Maybe they're used to spending money on, uh, let's say, commercial uh, communication satellites or commercial remote sensing satellites where the result can be clearly quantified to the stakeholders. Uh, but when you're looking at uh, space exploration, we all in this room, and I think everybody listening online knows and believes, and uh, you know, we're very clear with what the benefits are, but communicating that to the uh, political leaders who will be supporting these programs long term is, is a key factor for developing space nations. And the last point is that long term aspect. So we have to make sure that we get longevity in these programs. So launching one mission for a couple of years and then having a, a big pause or stop period, I think can be detrimental to the progression uh, of developing space nations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salem. I'm uh, asking now the same question um, to South Korea uh, and uh, to Mr. Guang. Um, what activities and plans do emerging uh, agencies have and what are your biggest challenges? Since CARI was established in uh, 1989, uh, CARI's space program was mainly focused on Earth observation satellite, as of launch vehicle development for LEO. So actually, Korea has been regarded as a sort of emerging country in space exploration perspective. Uh, in uh, 2008, the first Korean astronaut visited the ISS for 10 days after undergoing a 15 months training course at Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center under the support of the uh, Korean astronaut program. And later on, uh, the first Korean uh, lunar orbiter called KPLO is uh, supposed to be launched in summer 2022, since the Korean Lunar Pro Exploration Program officially commenced in uh, 2016. Uh, the KPLO will carry on five scientific instruments and one space internet demonstration payload. Uh, due to NASA provided the instrument, the shadow cam, the KPLO mission will be able to provide uh, the scientific data to be better understand the lunar poles and assist planning for some Artemis activities. So uh, the Korean government currently try to build up the big picture for Korean space exploration, including lunar landing, uh, Artemis contribution, and asteroid mission after signing Artemis Accord in last May. And uh, the one of the biggest challenge faced by uh, emerging countries, uh, including Korea, in joining global space exploration is to get through and overcome national consensus and priority issues. In general, Earth observation satellite programs are considered to have a more specific goal to resolve social needs and risk and in to enhance national welfare for better life. So normally, those priorities are notably dominant in most countries when allocating national budgets. So it is not easy to that uh, the space exploration is uh, situated on the first priority, especially in emerging state. Uh, same thing is true in our country. Nevertheless, uh, opportunity uh, for joining the global space exploration can be achieved by international collaboration and small set based new space approach, even with a small set budget. CubeSat based capstone program by NASA to provide the GPS like navigation infrastructure to lunar territory or a certain low cost CubeSat mission which will be deployed by Artemis Mission 1 can be the good example for emerging countries to join global space exploration with the basis of the uh, international collaboration and low cost small set. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wang. 
Um, I'm calling now on Mexico, on Salvador Landeros. What activities and plans um, uh, does uh, the Mexican Space Agency have and what are the biggest challenges and opportunities? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pascal. N nice to meet you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to be with you. Uh, the Mexican Space Agency as a Mexican government institution, an official Mexico's National Space World Directorate for Space Science and Exploration, has a defined set of objectives to accomplish such task in our national space programs 2224 in collaboration with mexican Aca academia national public research institutes and few but commitment companies aem is leading the transformational future of mexican space science and exploration with important and high high caliber science and initiatives. For example, our National Autonomous Mexican University, the biggest and public most important university in the country, within several research units and laboratories, is generating an integrative, integrative set of experimental, experimental science and element, elements for lunar and interplanetary space exploration scenarios. An important initiative commencing this year is the robotic SWAR mission Colmena, or HIVE, Hive mission, the most ambitious mission that UNAM AEM is developing. The mission aims to demonstrate the feasibility of building structures on, plan on planetary surfaces using swarms of organized robots. The payload com comprises a command telemetry and deployment module, which is produced by UNAM and which is carried by the Peregrine Lunar Model of NASA CLIPS awarded Astrobotic Company. This mission has the support of AEM, CONACYT, and UNAM and will be the first Mexican mission to the moon, which will represent a technological, strategic, and mediatic millstone for the country. On the other hand, Mexico has a strong interest from Mexican space science and technology emerging companies. As an example, we have the Realm, the Realm Labs, a Mexican startup with two important initiatives. A Jaguar One mission in 2022, which will launch two nano rovers to the surface, surface of the moon to obtain data from the lunar environment and in situ lunar resource utilization program ISRU being held in collaboration with the AM and the lunar, and the lunar services provider. The Biggest challenges, challenges our agency currently has is to define perfect matching goals in the interest of our national space exploration roadmap, a kind of the, of a Mexican GER, where our specific interests are covered in the following Soviets and matters, communications and networks, where we would like to count not only with support of ISEC, but with other space agency, agencies and international organizations where we have established a mechanism of, of collaboration with European and American academies, companies, and institutions. In space exploration, we would like to focus on space transport systems, collaborating with institutions and academies from Italy and France. And finally, taking advantage of well-developed Mexican knowledge in the field of civil engineering systems, we want to approach the same to lunar-based construction methods and habitats, all with Mexican companies' expertise from the public and private sectors whose knowledge could be adapted from air into the moon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Landeros. And uh, 
I'm calling now on Australia and uh, to Anthony Murphitt. Thank you, uh, Pascal, and it's great to be beaming in from Australia to talk to you all. Uh, for the first thing when thinking through challenges for emerging agencies, I'll just reinforce some of the other points that have been made. And we've got a lot of focus on ensuring that the public benefit is understood, not only to our decision makers, but to the community as a whole. And particularly as we face a lot of challenges around the world, such as the pandemic, being very clear why we need to make these investments and what it means to transforming our community's lives and looking after our welfare. Then from there, the other challenge we have just as an emerging uh, space agency, and this is what happened when we established the Australian Space Agency in 2018, quickly we had to say, what is Australia's role in space? How do we grow our industry capability so we can contribute? And then importantly, how do we give confidence to our international partners that we can be at the table and we can contribute to those uh, missions? So what did we do very early on? Some of the things that we did is very quickly came out with a civil space strategy for Australia to highlight both to our Australian community and our industry about where Australia could play its role, but importantly to broadcast to our international partners about what we could do. And we were very clear that we could grow and focus on our space industry. And we said we would do it four ways. Firstly, international partnerships is really fundamental for uh, any space activities and important for Australia to contribute. We had to build that national capability so that we could contribute to missions. We also have to provide a strong regulatory environment so we can operate uh, the long-term sustainability of space and we have to inspire the nation to have that workforce uh, in the future. They were key elements. And then we also went into the priority areas where Australia could plug into gaps into some of the into the markets internationally. For example, how do we leverage our location in the Southern Hemisphere to assist with communications as we've done for many, many years? And how do we look at other industries such as our resources and our mining sector and take some of the automation and robotics and what we call remote asset management, where we control very large infrastructure at very long distances and apply that to space. So they're the exciting opportunities. And while we have some of the challenges around ensuring that we can grow our industry, we're connecting into supply chains, the fact that space has become heavily commercial uh, it may, is really opening up tech, uh, the opportunities and particularly because technologies are smaller and cheaper. We heard from the UAE. These are really meaning that businesses can now think through those opportunities. And this is where things such as leveraging public-private parts are important. The one thing I'll say is one of the activities we are undertaking, we have a program called our Moon to Mars program. We we're working with NASA and its partners to go to the moon. And in that program, we're doing three things. One, we're lifting the capability of our businesses so that they can contribute to international supply chains. We're getting our businesses into those supply chains. And the exciting bit, which we call our Trailblazer program, is that we're looking and working with NASA about what is a mission and a signature mission for Australia and how it, we can support uh, an activity on the surface of the moon. And for us to do that, it does look at... I mean, we're looking at our capabilities in areas such as our mining and resources sector and taking some of this remote asset management capabilities that we have and show how we can use that on the surface of the moon and use some of that scientific endeavour we have around in situ resource utilisation because this would be fundamental to have a long-term and sustainable presence on the surface of the moon. And we have other areas we're exploring as well and whether it's leveraging our research and development in optical communications or other areas where we can look at space medicine because Australia is at the forefront of a lot of medical technologies. And again, as space becomes more accessible, we can look at transferring those technologies into space. So thank you very much. It's just a tremendously exciting time to be involved uh, in space exploration. Yes, thank you, Anthony. That's what we realised also being here in, in St. Petersburg. 
And the same question, what activities plans do um, uh, actually emerging uh, uh, agencies like Polsa have? What are the biggest challenging and opportunities? Uh, goes to Gregor Rochner, which is with us here in St. Petersburg. Please. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Polish Space Agency uh, is only seven years old, and I was appointed as president only four months ago. So the question, what is the role of emerging agencies, is the question I ask myself right now every day. And I would like to share with you my thoughts on this topic. I will do it in three steps. Firstly, I will try to describe the big challenge of the environment, of the landscape of uh, space exploration that we witness nowadays. Secondly, I will try to convince you that this big change is a great opportunity for emerging agencies. And uh, finally, I would like to share with you my thoughts how to use this opportunity for space exploration and space use, underlying the difference between the two. So what is the big change? I observe three phenomena, technological progress, satellite constellations, and emerging small companies. The technological progress brings miniaturization, uh, robotics, 3D printing, artificial intelligence. All this is resulting in lowering the cost. Even a few kilogram satellites can now have a, an important apparatus on board. And an example of that is that students in Poland, in Warsaw University of Technology, they created and successfully operated a satellite in their free time. Uh, second phenomena are the constellation of satellites, which in some applications are more efficient than, than big satellites. Uh, well, you can use a sort of mass production then, uh, you can use the redundancy offered by the number of satellites in the constellation, so maybe you can use some commodity components rather than space qualified components. Again, faster development, lower cost. And this is also the reason that in Poland we plan to have our national constellations of small satellites for, for Earth observation. Uh, and those two contribute to the third phenomenon I observe. This is the large number of small companies just run by students, uh, startups. And again, in Poland, we have at least 30 and we, we observe that they are growing. Some of them, they have already uh, big international successes. So this is the big change, and uh, in my mind, this big change is a great opportunity for the emerging agencies to make a big jump. So, and now what I understand by big jump, I mean that those emerging agencies do not necessarily need to follow the, the development path, the learning curves of the, of the big companies. They can jump on those paths. To illustrate better what I mean, let me use an example of banking sector in Poland. In the 90s, there was no banking sector. Everybody used cash except for some big savings. And suddenly, in the 90s, we have developed a banking system with credit cards, and we completely skipped the, the checks, ne never checks in Poland. So we jumped over the checks. Another example of this jump in banking was that we somehow jumped over the in-person banking. There was no banking, and then suddenly we developed a, a great system for electronics banking, which was for some time even better than in Western Europe, because there, there was no need. The, the banking, in-person banking, was quite developed. In our case, there was a big need, so we made a big jump. Another, another analog, maybe a little bit better to, to explain what I mean uh, uh, by this big jump for the agencies, is the, the computing. There were mainframe computers, and now we have PC plus internet, but the mainframes are still needed for some special applications. So for me, big mature agencies, I like mainframe computers, and the emerging uh, agencies, I like, like PCs and laptops with the internet. So, uh, they should concentrate on smaller tasks, but also on the interconnection and integration. So what do I mean by that in, in, in practice? So I here I have to distinguish the space use and the space exploration. For the space use, it is, it is somewhat more, more obvious because they are national needs. They, they are national needs for air observation data, for telecommunication, they are needs of the administration, of the industry, of citizens. And the role of the space agency is to ensure that those uh, needs are satisfied. It does not mean that the, that the agency should provide uh, all the tools, uh, should solve all the problems by itself, 
but it means that it, 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 it has to make sure that there will be some solutions. So again, the role of the integration is very important. And I see this integration in, in three dimensions again. The first dimension is the integration of the needs of, uh, of different sectors. Uh, for example, a Minister of Climate needs some satellite data uh, about the environment. And then the Minister of Agriculture needs similar data, somewhat different. So the role of the agency is to provide a solution for both, which is synergic. And this is the reason why in Poland we plan to build a national system for Earth observation. Uh, another dimension of integration is the integration between the administration, the science, and uh, uh, the industry. Uh, the role of the agency is to understand the need of the administration um, and understand it in an active way, because sometimes uh, people in the administration, they do not know that there are big possibilities. So we have to be proactive, we have to inform them what the possibilities are, and uh, we have to understand what their needs really are. Then we have to follow the signs, I mean, what are the, the, the possible solutions, and finally, uh, we have to, to work with industry so the industry can provide solutions for the administration using the advances of science. So th that's another, the second dimension of the, of the integration to be provided by emerging agencies. And finally, the third dimension of the integration is, is uh, to uh, creating a critical mass for projects. Because the tasks are usually too difficult, too complicated to be, to be solved by a single company or single institute. So we have to organize the work of uh, several institutions, several companies together. And this is precisely the role of, of, uh, of, of our agency. That's about space use. Now the space exploration is somewhat different. And again here, I have to distinguish small national uh, missions and the large missions. Uh, the countries having emerging companies, they can afford perhaps one or two small national missions. But they are very important because uh, they are necessary to grow domestic industry. Those small companies, they, they usually have no, no big experience, no space heritage, so it's difficult for them to compete in the tenders for, for, for big missions. Uh, but uh, applying for, for the participation in a small national mission, they can, they can get an experience, they can get space heritage, so, so uh, then they, they can uh, become the big players uh, in, in, in the international environment. It's a different story with large missions. With large missions we have to rely on international cooperation, so the role of the agency is to bridge the national science and, and, and industry with big agencies, with, with prime companies. And here comes the role of ISIG-G, I mean, to facilitate this bridging process. I mean, if we want to connect our science, our industry, to some, some large mission, to, to some long-term goals, uh, then, uh, thanks to, to, to Isaac, we should better know when and how to connect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gregor. I would like to um, ask again uh, the audience uh, to participate in the audience polling. You have more or less uh, very similar questions which I am posing now uh, to uh, the panel members and it would be great to have your response so that uh, we then can uh, put all this information together. And I'm coming to a second question um, uh, for all uh, our, our panel members. Um, however, I have to ask them because our time is running out to answer these questions really in a I would say, in, in a one-minute uh, pitch. How can emerging agencies benefit from an ad or advanced international partnership and future? What is the role of Isaac G uh, in that? If you could give each of, uh, of you a one-minute pitch, then we can still also discuss the audience polling and give uh, the chair of the Isaac G some time to reflect on that. So I'm calling now um, again on Gregor Vrochna. <laughs> uh, we are doing it the other way around now. Um, uh, what, um, in a very short pitch, how can emerging agencies benefit from the partnership in particular with Isaac G? 
Thank you. As I said, uh, to participate in large missions, we, we need the information. What are the places uh, we can enter? Uh, what are the, 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 the niches our emerging companies, uh, our uh, scientific institute can participate? And, and this is to me the role, the role of uh, ISEC-G, to provide the information and to, to find the right place for, for the partners uh, provided by, contacted by national agencies. Thank you very much, Gregor. And Anthony, far away in Australia, <laughs> can you give us your pitch? Yeah, thank you. No, I I can, yeah. So ISAC plays a really important role, and that's why we're so excited to join with Kari as the, the co-chairs and looking at the role of emerging uh, nations as we look at space exploration. So the things ISAC can do, identifying those missions and opportunities through its roadmaps. So they've said, this is what our path looks like, and then uh, countries such as ours can identify the gaps or where we can potentially play a role. A really important role is introducing those partnerships so we can introduce to our, our industries together and our agencies together so we can share in partnerships. And important, I want to come back to that uh, larger mission uh, context, it is for us to achieve some of these uh, activities going to the moon and onto Mars. We've got to do this in partnership. These are large collaborations and ISAC can really sort of bring uh, people together, highlight those opportunities so that we can go forward and uh, collaborate and go forward to that moon and on to Mars. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And I'm coming to Mexico, uh, Salvador Landeros. Well, how um, can you benefit, how can Mexico benefit from a participation in the Isaac G? Uh, thank, thank you, Pascal. Uh, we have a, a, an important project with, with NASA. It's a uh, uh, CubeSat Nanosatellite Constellation for for maritime spaces and marine vege vegetation observation. And uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, project is also uh, for communicate with low air orbit satellites and this technology will be profit to design an intelligent swarm system for tag embedded technologies for supply management missions on the moon on the moon low, low orbit. So this uh, is our ambition. Uh, comments small and grow, uh, and grow big. Many Mexican actors in space are getting involved exponentially since our first draft of our new space program. Organization like the Mexican Federation of the Aerospace Industry, that is the leader organization of the space industry in Mexico, with more than 200 companies, national and foreign, foreigners with some cement in the Mexican aerospace supply chain industry, are talking an active role like our allies, allies uh, and partners in this new endeavor. So uh, AMN was to be not the fundamental block in building this for Mexico, but the accompaniment partner with other countries in the process, not only through value individuals, valuable individuals, but with a strong collaborative effort to explore the more remote landscape of our fair, fair solar system and other planets, and the expect to explore the moon and other celestial bodies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Salvatore. And uh, I'm coming to South Korea, Mr. Guang. Uh, you are very familiar with Isaac G, but I'm sure you also have an opinion. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, back in uh, 2013, in the process of lunar program formulation for the first time, we realized that lunar exploration cannot be proceeded without uh, international partnership in many aspects, such as uh, communication and navigation, or science data standardization, or even the st scientific goal clarification, and so on. So at that time, Many international colleagues, including ISEC representatives, provided authentic advices to create the first Korean lunar exploration program. So I appreciated that. So, so as for the ISEC roles, actually, the, it is expected uh, in the near future, the emerging state can be accommodated to get the updated information 
and formulate new domestic and collaborative exploration program like us when we get together under the network of ISEC-G. So uh, that is the main reason why uh, ISEC-G organized uh, Emerging Space Agencies Working Group. Uh, so, so there are uh, I'm an African saying, if you want to go far, go together. So space exploration is a long way to go far. Let's explore it together. Thank you very much. Come to join uh, us, Isaac G. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kwang, and um, from South Korea. And uh, now I'm asking this uh, the same question to the last panel member, Salem Almari to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, what uh, is your connection and, and your benefits from the Isaac G? Thank you, Pascal. I, I think, you know, I echo what all the previous speakers said. And uh, what I would say is international cooperation uh, for large exploration programs is key. ISEC-G is uh, a perfect uh, venue to have those discussions. And we have uh, live examples of how international cooperation has supported human exploration. The ISS, the ISS is a prime example of that. Uh, going forward with what we see in the global exploration roadmap, uh, from ISEC-G and also uh, the, uh, the the gateway in the moon exploration program. That's also based on international cooperation. So this is really the, the, the way and the opportunity for emerging space nations to join in larger programs collaboratively. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salem. I'm now uh, coming to the, the audience polling, and I'm not sure if we can make that um, actually on the screen, if you can project that on the screen. So the first question was, in your opinion, what is the biggest obstacle for emerging nations for joining global space exploration? And I think you can see that. And um, obviously, I would like uh, to ask uh, Christian Lange to comment on that. I have to say I answered that question as well. And, uh, and I had actually, you know, a little bit of hesitation because I had the feeling there are several which should be crossed. But uh, you see that um, the comparatively small space budget uh, had really 63% uh, uh, answered um, and focused on that. Uh, could you eventually say something about it? Um, or what is uh, what is your opinion? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Pascal, for for throwing me in front of the bus. Um, no, it's it's really good, and I think we have already seen in the in the previous talks that yes, there's a lot of discussion about budget. We heard about uh, political will. We heard about the benefits to the public. And I think it's not only for the emerging space agencies, it's for, for all the space agencies, it's for every government agency or department to, to try to secure budgets for their priorities to implement their visions that they have. And I think it really is well in line uh, with the mandate also of the ISAC. If we look at the collaboration that we want to do, we want to share our visions, we want to find uh, key places for smaller agencies or for any agency actually to contribute to the larger vision. And I think the other two points in terms of public support and partnership, they really highlight the facts of, of what we want to achieve, consensus building, so on and so forth. So I think, yes, monies are important, but I think the, the work we do will actually help us to get us further with existing budgets and also with the budgets that we might want to convince the government to invest in this uh, very impressive and exciting endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Christian. And now, probably we can show the polls of the second question, which was um, how many uh, participants are, or also online are familiar with the Isaac G. No, um, I, have, I have not the questions, which I will ask in a minute. But as far as I remember, I have uh, also, yes. Uh, um, it was, uh, the answer was, Christian, that not so many, uh, that more people did not know about Isaac G, uh, but they think it is a very useful 
uh, platform, in particular after this panel. I'm sorry that we cannot blend it in right now, but this is just I wanted to tell you, and maybe you can keep an answer on that for your final argument. And I want to come, oh yeah, here we are. Yeah. So uh, it is though that, of course, a lot of people know Isaac G and think it is a useful platform and a lot of people think they don't know it yet uh, and uh, but think it's a useful platform in particular after this panel, so the majority. And this means also that more public outrage is necessary for Isaac G and probably more in your final statement you could also uh, mention the website. Um, I'm coming now to the questions and answers. We have very little time left. We have just a few minutes and we are uh, eating two, three minutes into the coffee break. But there are quite interesting questions and please uh, uh, if I ask uh, the people that they could actually really answer very short. There is one question which is going to Anthony Murford. What support does the Australian government, community and ecosystem offer to space startups companies in Australia? Thank you for the question. So a couple of things that uh, we're doing. One, we're investing in joint infrastructure so that companies can undertake some of their space activities. For example, we're just invested in payload qualification facilities. Other things that we're investing is, is thinking through how we're going to invest and support in a future workforce. And I think the biggest value we do is not just in our programs like infrastructure, it comes back to coordinating activities all across government to show the the impact that space can have and that allows us to build scale and by building scale we can then attract uh, inward investment which actually can then spurn and uh, further build our space ecosystem. Thank you very much Anthony. Then I have um one uh, question which uh, I'm going to answer <laughs> in the name of the IAF. Um, is there a possibility for emerging space agencies to come together and create a common program or coordinated projects in space exploration? So I just wanted to tell you that apart from the Isaac G, which I think is really taking care of this issue with a special working group, you have also the United Nations Committee um, uh, on the Office of Outer Space Affairs, which has a lot of activities for many, many countries because it has, uh, I think, 95 members. And also the International Astronautical Federation has an administrative committee on developing countries and emerging communities with a very easy name to remember. The older generation will know exactly what I mean, ACDCEC. Yeah, and um, uh, which has really been formally established uh, to advance, um, you know, the, the Federation's work really in respect to developing countries. So you see you have many different avenues and, and please go on the website of the Isaac G, go on the website of the IAF, go on the website of the uh, United Nations. But there is a really important question for Isaac G. I don't know if, if Christian wants to take it um, at the chair or um, hand it over. Can private, it's the last question which I, I, I can ask because we are eating in the coffee break, can private companies from emerging agencies benefit from their agency's participation in Isaac G? Take that one. The, Should the I short repeat answer. that? No, I'm good. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so I would say the, the short answer is yes. And the longer winded answer is, which also brings another point I wanted to, to make a bit later, uh, the ISAC-G is a space agency coordination forum. So it's really space agencies talking to each other. And however, the information that we bring to the ISAC, the information that's, uh, that is shared helps each individual agency to position their own plans and also to define their own plans. And in that context, obviously, those agencies can then reach out to their national stakeholders, including their industry, to make sure that they have the open dialogue and be well informed and they represent, uh, for instance, in this case, industry plans uh, well in this International Space Exploration Forum and help to coordinate and, and move forward with their national interests. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. And I just want to say we have uh, really discussed today the important task of the 
uh, International Space Exploration Coordination Group to support and engage emerging space nations and to support also and help to integrate their space activities. And I want to give uh, uh, Christian uh, Lange the possibility to uh, give a one minute, two minute speech uh, uh, at the end of this panel as the chair of the Isaac G. Yeah. Thank you, Pascal, and uh, thank you everyone, also the panelists, for contributing today. I hope uh, everyone found it interesting. I, I think the, the key points that I took away are, uh, well, yes, collaboration is, is really important. We want to secure the political well, uh, will. Sorry, we have a, a change a bit in the landscape. There's more commercial activities. We heard about uh, cheaper space solutions, lots of new companies. We heard about supply chains. We heard about the advances in technology also making things smaller and cheaper. And which brings also the point to uh, the strategic positioning of, of agencies of countries in this global context, matching national priorities and the strength of all the different countries and their industries and their academic sector with this global endeavor. We heard about the importance of, I would say, early wins and the visibility. We heard about consensus building that we have in the nations. We heard about regulatory pieces. And I think the, the key points I took away from the discussion on the ISEC itself and the second question was the focus on coordination, defining a common path, facilitating partnerships and, and sharing knowledge. And I think if you do all those things, we can create a lot of excitement, leapfrog technologies, and I guess we can have a longer discussion on who's the mainframe and who's the laptop or the cell phone to make things work. But it seems there's room for everyone to, uh, to move forward. Pascal asked me earlier, what's the web address? So it's www.globalspaceexploration.com. So we are looking forward to have more space agencies joining the ISAC and helping us to explore together. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Christian. Congratulations to the ISAC with now six, 26 numbers. I want to um, thank uh, the chair of the ISAC G, Christian Lange. I want to thank all the panels members here in St. Petersburg, but also remotely. I want to thank the audience for the participation. And I have to give uh, further to Christian, who uh, continues with the logistics. Thank you very much for participating. It was a great panel. Thanks, Pascal, for moderating it so well. Uh, indeed, a topic that could, uh, would need a bit more time to discuss. <laughs> now, we've eaten a bit into the coffee break, so we break now for the coffee. Please be back in some 15, 20 minutes as we are going to continue here. And please also join your technical session of your choice as well that will uh, um, start again at 3.30. Thank you.